Hi friends, welcome to my recap of JW Broadcasting for January 2022, where they feature part one of the 137th annual meeting of the Watchtower Bible and Track Society of Pennsylvania. It was held in the in person in the Warwick Auditorium. Listen, this broadcast was nearly two hours long, so I am going to show you the highlights plus at the end, they show a talk by Kenneth Cook, which I have omitted completely. It is just so convoluted and confusing. I may do another recap just on that talk alone. I'm not quite sure. So I've not included it here, but um, anyway, let's uh, begin. It starts with a talk on timing by the chairman, Mark Sanderson. Check it out. Well, think for a moment about prophesied events that took place right on time. Jesus was baptized at precisely the time when the Messiah was prophesied to appear. The kingdom began its heavenly rule right on time in 1914. Did you hear that? That was really slick on the part of Mark Sanderson. The kingdom did not begin in 1914, and he knows that. I mean, how many failed predictions can one organization have? In 1894, they said that that it would be the end of the time of trouble would be in 1914. And then in 1917, they changed it to 1918, and it goes on and on and on from there. But there's something else that Jehovah has promised to provide at the proper times. Well, what did Jesus say here? He said he would appoint a faithful and discreet slave who would provide the spiritual food. But there's another important detail there. Did you notice it? He added at the proper time. Well, because of Jehovah's perfect sense of time, he knows exactly what his people need and he knows exactly the right time to provide it. All right, let's look at these verses that he read. But first, I just want to explain something. In ancient times in the Middle East, wealthy landowners, homeowners, would have more than one home. And in their absence, they would place a servant in charge. And this servant was uh, in charge of not only the household, but keeping the household servants fed. Okay, it's not like they could just go down to the corner to a grocery store. Jesus begins by asking what the owner of the estate should expect from this servant. The parallel here is the believer's readiness for the return of Christ. Here are the verses. I'm not going to read all of them, just what's in yellow. We talk about the good man of the house would not have suffered if he were ready and watched. He would not have suffered his house to be broken up. Be ye also ready for the return of Christ. Verse 45, who then is a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord has made ruler over his household. It's simple. The verse explains it very clearly, but Mark Sanderson and his governing body friends want their followers to believe that they make up a composite slave. That's not even what the verse says. Just as World War II was erupting, the November 1st, 1939 issue of the Watchtower featured an in-depth discussion of the topic of neutrality. That timing was absolutely perfect. Because of those articles, our brothers worldwide knew exactly what to do as the war engulfed the entire planet. He goes on and on with their publications, the Enjoy Life Forever book. He brings in Yankee Stadium. How many times are we going to have to hear about Yankee Stadium? It's almost been a hundred years, friends. And then he wraps it up with, of course, the main topic, the pandemic, and how Jehovah provided in various ways. So anyway, he features a new Caleb and Sophia video that is pretty amazing. It's about how Sophia is bullied at school by a classmate, and it's very interesting. Here's just a glimpse. Okay, class, here are the results from yesterday's test. Good work, Sophia. Hey, Angela, what'd you get? I don't care. 
Whoa, D plus? Well, at least there's a plus. Whatever. What are you looking at? Uh. <laughs> Oops, I didn't see you there. It's like you're invisible. <laughs> Is everything all right, honey? Um... See you tomorrow. Caleb, what are some things that you can pray for? Well, I can pray for things that make me happy. Like a helicopter. Or a mountain of ice cream. God's kingdom, and to help our brothers and sisters. That's right. There's a girl at school. She's so mean to me. I prayed for it to stop, but nothing's happened. There is someone in the Bible who felt the same way you do. Her name was Hannah. Hannah loved Jehovah very much. Hey, oh, wait for me! But someone named Penina was very mean to her. It's so nice to see the children play, isn't it? She was very jealous of Hannah. You think you're so special, Hannah? <laughs> Then why hasn't Jehovah given you any children? So Sophia's father's solution to this bullying is to read her a story about an Old Testament character by the name of Hannah. Do you know who Hannah was? It's, uh, the, it's in Sam, 1 Samuel chapters 1 and 2. Hannah was Samuel's mother. What was Hannah's problem? Hannah's problem was that she could not have children. That is Sophia's father, her father's solution to the bullying. She gets pregnant and dedicates Samuel to the Lord. That's the story. So check out the rest of the video. Please give me a child. If you do, I will give him to you all his life to serve you. What are you doing? Why are you drunk? I know that Angela and the other girls are going to be mean to me. But please help me to be like Hannah tomorrow. Help me to be strong like her. Stop, Angela. You're being mean. And if you keep being mean, I'm going to tell. No, you won't. Yes, I will. You can't tell me what to do. Let's go, Zoe. Hannah gave birth to a son and named him Samuel because, as she said, It is from Jehovah that I have asked him. There is no one holy like Jehovah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to move on to David Splane. This is where I'm going to focus most of my time. He gives a talk on entitled The Way to Holiness. He'll discuss a few verses explaining this road 
through the desert from Babylon to Jerusalem and and th how the spiritual aspect of it was somewhat fulfilled by Charles Charles Taze Russell. And we're going to go through this and see what we can find out. Check it out. It said that there were 50 pagan temples in the capital alone. But there was no temple of Jehovah there because they wanted to leave Babylon and reestablish pure worship in the promised land in Israel. And so, if they were physically able to do so, they would leave Babylon and travel to Jerusalem, a city most of them had never seen, a city in ruins. But Jehovah promised to make the trip from Babylon to Jerusalem as easy as possible. And to confirm that and to get a little picture in our minds, we're going to read a series of four different scriptures. And each scripture is going to add a little detail to what Jehovah had in mind. So the first one is found in Isaiah chapter 40, verses 3 and 4. A voice of one calling in the wilderness, clear up the way of Jehovah, make a straight highway through the desert, a straight highway through the desert for our God. Let every valley be raised up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The rough ground must become level, and the rugged ground a valley plain. All right, friends, listen, before we move on, I just want to show you beyond a shadow of a doubt how this verse spiritually was fulfilled. It has nothing to do with Russell, and Splain's entire talk is basically a waste of time. So physically, when, when kings would visit a new area, they would travel, they would send people before them to pave the way, to remove the rocks, to level the holes in the desert because it was rough, it was rugged, so that the king's journey was as smooth as possible. So Isaiah 40 is speaking about a particular person and scripture tells us exactly who that person is. Uh, many of you may know this, but um, David Splain does not. All right, let me show you. Here is Isaiah 40 that he read. Look at what's in yellow. Make straight in the desert a highway for who? Our God. David Splain even read the verse that way. Remember that because that's very interesting. It was also prophesied in Malachi 3, 1. You see it there in yellow? Surely, friends, you know who fulfilled this. So friends, if you remember Matthew chapter two to the wise men when they were looking for Jesus when he was born, what did they say? Where is he that is born king of the Jews? So Jesus was born a king. Jesus is the king. These verses are talking about Jesus and John was the forerunner of Jesus to announce his coming. Matthew three makes it clear that John the Baptist is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Mark declares it as well, Luke and John. So John the Baptist fulfilled Isaiah chapter 40 verses three and four. He was the voice crying in the wilderness, wilderness make straight in the desert a highway for our God. David Splain read it. Jesus is the king. He prepared the way for Jesus, yet Isaiah 40 called him God. You have to think about that, friends. David Splain didn't even realize what he read. But he's going to tell us this whole talk is built around trying to lead you to believe that these verses mean something else. So let's keep going back to David Splain. It talks about making a straight highway through the desert. If some of you have gone to the Ramapo Project, you know what site work is all about. But this was going to be a big job. But So we know that there's going to be a straight highway between Babylon and Jerusalem. What else can we learn? Isaiah 57 and verse 14 says, It will be said, Build up, build up a road, prepare the way. And here it comes. Remove any obstacle from the way of my people. So now we have two details. It's going to be a straight highway through the desert, and all of the obstacles are going to be cleared 
away. So let's take a look at Isaiah 57 to see what these, what David Splain calls obstacles really are. I think you're going to be fascinated. The King James calls it a stumbling block. David Splain says obstacles. Let's jump back to verses three through five to see what this stumbling block or obstacles are. What's underlined? Ye sons of the sorceress, the seed of the adulterer and the whore. And ye not, are ye not children of transgression, a seed of falsehood, inflaming yourselves with idols under every green tree? Listen to this, slaying the children in the valleys under the cliffs of the rocks. Friends, these verses call, use words like adulterer and whore because of the nature of the pagan worship they had turned to. I'm not even gonna get into it, but they were temple prostitutes. Let's just say that, that they had to go through these temple prostitutes, true prostitutes in order to get to the worship of the false gods. Anyway, they were going up to the, the tops of the mountains or the high places in the groves, in the, the forests, and they were sacrificing their children to the false gods, the babies. That's what they were doing. So what is the stumbling block that Isaiah 57 is talking about? Idolatry. David Splain wants you to believe that this verse is talking about rocks on the road from Babylon to Jerusalem. So Splain cites Isaiah 35, 8 through 10, but he fails to read verse 10. I don't know, maybe he forgot it, not sure. So let's see what he has to say about these verses and then we'll examine them ourselves. But now most highways have a name. Some of them are named after famous people. Others have a number. Does this special highway have a name? It does. And we go to Isaiah 35, 8 to 10 to find that name. And a highway will be there, yes, a way called, here it comes, the way of holiness. The unclean one will not travel on it. It is reserved for the one walking on the way. No one foolish will stray onto it. No lion will be there and no vicious wild beasts will come on it. They will not be found there. Only the repurchased ones will walk there. So what's the name? What's the special name of this highway? The Way of Holiness. Isn't that a nice name for a highway? I want to explain to you about this highway, okay? This highway that was traveled from Babylon, false religion, to Jerusalem, the point where the Jews would worship the true God of the Bible, okay? But spiritually, I want to show you this. This is really fascinating. I like to use the 1828 Webster Dictionary, friends, when looking at these verses in the King James Bible. Notice what's underlined in red, the definition of highway. The earth was raised to form a dry path. It was technically a high way. All right, so the land in the desert was very, very rugged. So God cast up a highway to show them the way, a smooth path to show them the way. We're just going to read the colored words. A highway shall be there and a way called the way of holiness. But the redeemed shall walk there and the ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion. Friends, in verse 8 in pink, that highway, the high way, the way of holiness. Moving down, John 14, Jesus is the way, friends. Hebrews 7 says that this high priest, Jesus, is holy. And in John 12, notice, Jesus was lifted up from the earth. So this highway in the desert that was lifted up, raised to show the way is Jesus. Jesus was lifted up. It's the way of holiness. Jesus is holy. Jesus is the way, but there's so much more. Check this out. All right, Isaiah 35, 9, the redeemed shall walk there. Who are the redeemed? Ephesians 1, 
we have redemption through his blood. Colossians 1, in whom we have redemption through his blood. Who are the redeemed who will walk on this highway, friends? Christians, of course. It all makes sense. Keep going. The verse he didn't read in orange. And the ransomed of the Lord shall return. Matthew 20. Jesus gave his life for a ransom for many. Who are the redeemed? Who are the ransomed? Who will walk on this high way? That which was lifted up. Christians. Splain makes it so difficult. But listen, let's get back to it. So only those who were clean and acceptable in Jehovah's eyes were welcome to travel from Babylon back to Jerusalem. We don't know whether there was any literal road work done on the road between Babylon and Israel. It may be all figurative, but there could have been some road work done. Uh, notice what Jehovah uh, told the Jews to do in Jeremiah chapter 31 and verse 21. Uh, why would Jehovah say all of these things if, if it was all to be ignored literally? Uh, Jeremiah 31 and verse 21. He says, Set up road markers for yourself and put up signposts. Pay attention to the highway, the way that you have to go. Return, O virgin of Israel. Return to these cities of yours. So no doubt, the first groups to use the road would uh, remove obstacles and level things uh, out the best they could so that those who followed would have an easier journey. High heaps. High heaps for the highway, pointing the way for the redeemed and the ransomed. So listen, Splain now drones on and on about sight work on the road, the history of the Bible, the importance of the name Jehovah, most of which I cut out. We're about ready to finish up with him, but check it out. So now what have we learned? What have we gleaned from this series of scriptures? First, there's a highway, a highway through the desert. We've also learned that it's to be cleared of obstacles. It has a special name, the, the way of holiness. And there were, to re, there were to be signposts so that those who traveled the road wouldn't get lost and maybe stray onto some other road to make it as easy as possible for the Jews to leave Babylon and go back to Israel and reestablish pure worship. What does it have to do with us today? Plenty. Because today, not tens of thousands, but millions of men, women, and children are responding to the command, the urgent command, get out of her. Get out of Babylon the Great. And the situation is different from the situation of the Jews in ancient times because they had a choice. They could remain in Babylon and still serve Jehovah. But people today have no choice. They must leave Babylon the Great. Their life depends on it. Now, without looking for a type, an anti-type, and trying to fit everything in very neatly uh, in this uh, arrangement, and we can say that there are some similarities between what happened to the Jews in ancient times and what is happening today. Because in a sense, when you start to study the Bible with someone, you are pointing him in the direction of the way of holiness. Now some start studying and they start traveling on the road and then they turn back. But others keep going and they become dedicated, baptized disciples of Christ. In the years leading up to 1919, when Babylon the Great fell, more road work, road work was done. And so we have men who share the fruitage of the research in tracts, in books, publications of all kinds, because they want the people to know. They want to reduce that mountain of ignorance. You see how he sneaks in this Jehovah's Witness propaganda? Babylon the Great did not fall in 1919. Show me where in scripture it says this that is found only in Jehovah's Witness publications, friends. It's a lie. So I cut out the majority of the rest of his talk on this site work on the road from Babylon to Jerusalem. He starts talking about how men published tracts in the 1700s, and then he goes on from there. Let's just wrap it up with Splain. Well, we know that George Storrs had an influence on Charles Taze Russell. And what do we know about Brother Russell? 
and his associates. They weren't the first to discover that the Trinity and the immortality of the soul are false doctrines, or even that Christ's presence would be invisible to the human eye. They benefited from the careful preparatory work that other road workers had done in the past. So, translators, printers, and Bible students were doing spiritual sight work. And we might say that Brother Russell and his associates put the final touches on that way of holiness. Because Brother Russell and his associates, who had finished their earthly course, they were able to look down from the heavens. And can you imagine how excited they were when they saw the first travelers set foot on the way of holiness? It wouldn't be surprising if Brother Russell and his associates were firmly involved in the maintenance program of that way of holiness today. 1919, the slave is appointed. By 1921, you have a brand new publication, The Harp of God. All of these publications have been used to help people to break free from Babylon the Great. And this is proof positive that maintenance on the way of holiness is ongoing. Well, we sincerely thank you, Brother Splain, for that fascinating discussion about the way of holiness. So Mark Sanderson thinks that David Splain's talk is a fascinating discussion. Yeah, okay. Let's move on to Jeffrey Jackson. I removed once again most of this talk. Like I said, this was a two-hour JW Broadcasting, friends. But listen, Jackson's talk is extremely confusing. He goes on and on about different ways that a person's name is written in the Book of Life in pencil. In pencil. It's laced, heavily laced with Jehovah's Witness doctrine, but he mentions something very interesting that there's a change in their understanding. Check it out. Are you there? Is your name there? Is your name written in the book of life? Jesus said, do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tombs will hear his voice and come out those who did good things to a resurrection of life, and those who practice vile things to a resurrection of judgment. All right, I'm going to show you exactly what this verse means beyond a shadow of a doubt, friends. The King James calls it a resurrection of damnation, friends, not judgment. Second Peter clarifies this by saying in yellow, to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment, there you go, to be punished. Job says that the wicked is reserved to the day of destruction, to the day of wrath. So the resurrection of the unjust will be judged and condemned. Scripture is very clear about that, okay? So I want to show you what this man, Jeffrey Jackson, who declares himself to be one of Christ's brothers, has to say about what he read here in John 5, 28 and 29 as a reminder. Here it is. Let's think about those verses in John chapter 5, 28 and 29. Up to now, we have understood Jesus' words to mean that the resurrected ones will do good things and some will do vile things after their resurrection. But notice there in verse 29, Jesus didn't say they will do these good things or they will practice vile things. He used the past tense, didn't he? Because he said they did good things and they practiced vile things. So this would indicate to us that these deeds or actions were committed by these ones prior to the death and before they would be resurrected. So that makes sense, doesn't it? Because no one's going to be allowed to practice vile things in the new world. So what did Jesus mean when he mentioned uh, these two factors? Well, for a start, we could say the righteous ones still, when they're resurrected, have their names written in the book of life. It's true, Romans chapter 6 verse 7 says that when someone dies, 
His sins are canceled. What? Friends, I have to interject because this is a terrible lie. Let me show you. Sins are not canceled. Here is what the verse says, and then we'll put it into context. What's in pink, starting in verse 6, that our old man is crucified with him. With who? Jesus. That the body of sin might be destroyed, verse 7. For he that is dead is free from sin. It doesn't say sins are canceled, friends. Friends, born-again Christians are freed from sin. Remember the picture, picture of baptism that I, that I do. Baptism represents buried with Christ and raised to new life. That's a born-again Christian. Born-again Christians have their sins cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what these verses are talking about. Jehovah's Witness doctrine is self-atonement. They say that at death our sins are canceled for a second chance. But Ephesians 4.24 says that uh, ye put on the new man, the new man, buried in, uh, buried in death and raised to new life as a new man. Spiritually, we are dead to sin and we are alive in Christ. Christ was raised bodily from the dead, therefore we live. That's what these verses are talking about. Those who die without Christ have not had their sins cleansed and are considered the unjust. The unjust will be resurrected to condemnation. They did not accept the free gift of salvation. As stated in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, that gift is available to, to people who put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Take note of this. Not their record of faithfulness. That's not canceled. So the righteous ones are resurrected into the new world and their names are still in the book of life. Of course, they need to remain faithful during the thousand years to keep their names in that book of life. But what about the unrighteous ones? Well, these are the ones who did vile things before they died. So when they're resurrected, they don't have their names in the book of life. It's not a resurrection to life. It's a resurrection to judgment. Now, why do we say that? Because there we could say the word judgment is not referring to a condemnation. It's not referring to something that is totally negative. It's true. At times, the word judgment can have that meaning. But in the context of these verses, it seems that Jesus is using the word judgment in a more neutral sense. So it means more an evaluation or a probation period. So the unrighteous ones will have an opportunity to accept this wonderful education work that's going to be done in the new world. And during that time, they will be evaluated. And if they dedicate their lives to Jehovah, then their names will be written into the book of life. What education work? Where does the Bible say that there's going to be an education work during the millennial reign of Christ? Hebrews 9.27 says it's appointed man once to die and then the judgment. How much more clear can scripture be, friends? No second chance to accept Jehovah's Witness doctrine during Christ's millennial reign. That's a lie. Now, at this point, you're probably thinking, hmm, is this an adjustment to our understanding? Yes, it is. So now you think, now, can you just run that past me again? That's all I could take of Jackson. He moves on to, to Daniel and he goes on to explain nonsense about Daniel and in order, in a desperate attempt to put weight on their doctrine, but their doctrine is a false doctrine, friends. It's all lies, and it's no wonder we were always so confused. Well, hmm, there you have it. 
Anyway, friends, listen, Kenneth Cook comes up. I told you in the beginning, I've cut that out because it's just awful. And then they recap all of the accomplishments for the prior year. I had mentioned this in the beginning. I cut all of that. We've seen it all. We've heard it all, how wonderful Jehovah has been during the pandemic. But then also they tell us how, what, 25,000 or so of them, of Jehovah's Witnesses have, have passed away. I don't get it. It doesn't make sense. What do you think about this, friends? Hopefully you've learned that Christ is the highway through the desert. He is the only way to God. That's why he came. That's why he gave his life so that we could live, friends. He conquered death. He was raised bodily from the dead. Russell and his publications are not the highway to God at all. So I've put some uh, video links down in the description box. I've also um, put uh, videos that you can click on. If you want to learn more about the resurrection, I did a video or two last year or something, and um, you can check those out. We'll tell, tell you all about the resurrection, friends. Choose life. Choose Christ. Choose that highway. It's a free gift, friends. You don't have to work it. Work for no it. amount of letter writing or door knocking can earn you salvation. It's Christ that highway, friends. It's a new year. Put the lies of these deceivers behind you and step into the real light, the light of Jesus Christ for the new year, friends. Thanks so much for watching. Have a great day.